Um, it's my absolute distinct pleasure uh, to introduce you to Dr. Julie Freitschlag, who no needs no introduction whatsoever. All of us are very familiar with her career. Um, it's uh, my, my pleasure uh, to introduce her. She is currently the CEO and Dean at uh, Wake Forest uh, Baptist Medical Center. Prior to that, um, she was the Vice Chancellor and Dean at uh, UC Davis. And prior to that, I had the distinct pleasure of working for her at Hopkins, where she literally transformed a traditional department into a modern uh, department. And her leadership style uh, was just incredible, as many of us in this room um, have experienced. Um, Julie's national leadership includes former governor and secretary of the Board of Governors, a regent and past chair of the Board of Regents. She's internationally recognized ex expert in the treatment of thoracic outlet syndrome. And believe it or not, even as CEO and dean, she still operates and does these cases and just uh, recently did a case. Um, she's received many teaching awards, including uh, an achievement award from the Department of Veteran Affairs. And she's been um, elected to the National Academy of Medicine. She often talks about leadership style and work-life balance, and uh, I, I am certain that you will thoroughly enjoy and uh, enjoy and learn a lot from her and her lecture in terms of leadership style and work-life balance. And again, Dr. Freischlag, Julie, I am so honored to have you here today. Thank you very much. I got a little teary-eyed, uh, <laughs> sort of like seeing one of your children graduate from college, you know, <laughs> to see Martha lead uh, as president of this society, and it was just my distinct um, pleasure to come, and I didn't realize I know so many endocrine surgeons, <laughs> but many of you uh, have worked with me either at Hopkins, where we actually differentiated a, a section of uh, endocrine surgery, or um, I trained part of you and decided I'm not being a vascular surgeon, I'm going to go do something else, so I helped you make that decision, um, or that you served on editorial boards, gave boards with me, and I really appreciate all that you've done uh, to really differentiate your specialty. I also have known uh, Dr. Orlo Clark for a long time because I was a West Coast person. I go either coast, sort of what I do for a living. Uh, and I really am honored to give this uh, lecture uh, in his honor and his wife. So I'm going to talk a little bit about being brave, and I actually think your society is. I heard there's 500 of you here today, and back when I started surgery, I must admit, if someone said you were in endocrine surgery and just focused on that, they would have said, oh, but aren't you a general surgeon? I'm sure many of you hear that. I remember years ago uh, when we were giving boards and we were talking about, you know, how do you train a surgeon? I still give general surgery boards, and what is a general surgeon? And I remember using your specialty as an example, saying, say you needed your thyroid out. I actually said this. They said, would you go to a broadly-based general surgeon, or would you find a specialist to take that out? And... Uh, Wally Ritchie said, well, 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 and, uh, and I said, I think I know the answer, right? You would go find, if possible, that specialist. Um, so let's talk about brave. So what is brave? It's really ready to face and endure danger or pain, showing courage. I think we do that every day as surgeons. The quality of, of being brave, facing odds, endure pain and hardship. That's probably training to be a surgeon, right, to do it. And braving, to endure or face conditions without showing fear. And as you go through your career, and many of you, uh, I have given counsel about your new leadership positions and what you're doing. We're so proud of Dr. Zeiger being a new chair of surgery at UVA. And now that I'm a CEO and dean, what does that mean? I know one of my daughter-in-laws asked me, she goes, what exactly do you do? You know, <laughs> and uh, she's a lawyer. Uh, but... Um, um, <laughs> So part of it is, you know, what am I doing doing that? For those of you that know Wake Forest Baptist, you know, we just uh, bought another hospital. 20,000 people work for me. I've got great teams at work. Uh, but as a leader, you need to go out there and show no fear as you go forward, whether it's to your patients, your people, your trainees, or whatever, even though you may have lots of fear for outcomes. 
So this is the two of the bravest people I know. That's that patient who's being brave to try to get healthy. And that's that health care provider who's so brave to take a few moments, despite RVUs and 23-hour stays and all the things you've had to do to change your specialty, mine too as a vascular surgeon, to sit down and look that patient right in the eyes and have a wonderful conversation. And that's brave these days, because now in all the rigmarole of what we do to run healthcare centers, uh, looking at, you know, North Carolina is not a Medicaid expansion state. We have almost 2 million people uninsured in this state. You know, how do you make people healthier and better in this state? Uh, the healthiest county in North Carolina is Wake County here, but it's ranked 150th in the country. So we have very non-healthy population in North Carolina with many retirees coming here. So being brave to be that doctor you want to be is this picture I show you today. And as you go forward to lead... Um, you may feel like that little dog. I know I have. You know, as I went off to be a division chief at UCLA and I was in charge of everyone that trained me, that taught me skills. Uh, then I went off to Hopkins where I had not trained there uh, and that taught me skills. And for 11 years, I was the only woman chair at that institution. And you may feel that way whether you're female or where you trained or what you did. I remember one of the biggest things we did at Hopkins is we only took people from about five or six schools, seriously. And one of them, they weren't my school. <laughs> so we needed to change that quickly, right? And so one of the diverse things we did was take a guy from Oregon, you know, and it was like, oh my goodness, are we going to be able to go shopping across the country for the best and brightest? And we certainly did. So there will be times that you feel like that little dog, um, but you need to act like the big one. So I want to talk a bit about burnout. Uh, one thing, this is an ad. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing a new survey from the American College of Surgeons. I did this one with Charlie Balch about 10 years ago. And uh, Shel Brownstein, who's a trauma surgeon at UNC, who did a survey years ago with George Sheldon. She was my medical student, actually, at UCLA. We're doing a new one. So it's going to be coming out in the next few months, and you all need to fill it out. And it's going to be talking not only about burnout, but also chronic pain issues issues with being a surgeon. We're going to look at demographics. What do rural surgeons do? So you need to do this. But this was the first time way ahead of most everyone talking about it is about burnout. And all of you know about it. It is a days or time where you feel sad. And we've all had those times. There's no question I've had those times. And Barbara Bass, who's the chair of surgery at Methodist, says it's those days that you want a snow day. I remember when I moved to Baltimore, uh, my son was seven when I became chair of surgery, and we, he had grown up in Los Angeles. He didn't remember being born in Milwaukee because we moved when he was three. And one day it snowed in Baltimore, and for those of you who know, it's like snowing in North Carolina. Everything closes like three days before the snow even gets there, right, to do it. All schools are closed. And he goes, Mom, what's this? And he, I said, a snow day. You don't have to go to school. He goes, Mom, we should have moved here years ago, you know, to do it. <laughs> Because in L.A., all he did was his little uh, earthquake bag where he had all his b bags. In case there was an earthquake, he had a, like a, a little bar, you know, a juice box just in case you couldn't find your parents with the earthquake. So he didn't know about snow days. So you all have had this time, and you all have, are dealing with people, your partners, if your chairs, your lab. And you need to watch for this. Because just like many things, we have a lot of talk now, and I just wrote an article which was published in JAM on Me Too, um, the most important thing is not the person who's sad. It's really the person that will notice someone sad. So your job is to watch out for your partners, your bosses, your chairs, your residents, and your students. And you're the one that can help this too. And it can happen to you, and most of us are most focused on ourselves. And this is a list. You can find tons of articles that list all sorts of physician, who's the worst, who's the best, who's, who doesn't have it. I must admit, I... I actually thought um, urologists were always happy because they made all so many jokes, and I didn't know that dermatology was sad because there was just sort of skin-deep people. But here we are, you know, and, and you know radiology doesn't get to know patients like you do, right? So they, they're stuck in a dark room unless they're an interventionist. So all of us have an opportunity uh, to be overwhelmed.
And when you look at it, our patients don't do well if we don't do well. I just read a book called Patients Come Second, and that sounds awful, doesn't it? But it's a whole book about if your health care provider is not healthy, then you can't take care of those patients. We used to think if patient satisfaction was up here, we all get graded on it, right? You know your scores. We motivate everyone for that. Uh, but if your health care providers, nurses, doctors, techs, anybody, if they're not sad, if they're sad, they don't take good care of patients. Think back to when you were sleep deprived, like I was training every other night in hospital. I wasn't that nice to people. And, and I remember uh, yelling like that big dog, but you know, yelling is a form of communication. It's just not a good one, I'll tell you. But you can feel like this. And suicide is high. I've had three residents when I trained commit suicide. I've had two friends commit suicide in their 50s and 60s. And one of the most unknown stats is over the age of 60, white men have a high incidence of suicide with firearms. I learned that when I was in Davis. And so we do have increasing risk that does not go away. Now, it's bad for patients, I mentioned. As you get sadder, it gets worse for your patients. No one can leave. This is going to be very happy real soon. I'll tell you how to work with this. But you need to know. You need to know this about who you are, who your people are you work with, and that everyone has this opportunity to get better. But surgeons, surgeons who make errors work a little bit more. So we do need to watch how we work, who we are, and how we're paying attention. So how do you get brave? How do you empower others around you to love what they do as much as you love it, to have passion for their work, and, and then make you have a team that's amazing? When I think back to the work we did at Hopkins, uh, quite a few of you are in the audience who were part of my team. Empowering teams, teams at work, uh, are the best way to make your team work. I remember we redid our blue and gold surgery to surgical oncologists and actually had a, a section of endocrine surgery. That was a radical in 2004 and 5. Uh, and Martha led that along with hiring specialists so that she had a whole team that really were focused on endocrine surgery. I must admit, I, I do chuckle. I, I, I wonder which orifice next you're going to take a thyroid out of, okay? I, I've seen it in, in, in here. That's my part. You know, I knew all about armpits to do it, and I just saw something down the mouth, I guess. You know, the thyroid is right here still, isn't it? Uh, um, now, now, part of it... Um, I'm a, you know, carotids, we have to have the same problem. It's right here, too, and somehow we want to put $10,000 worth of stents in those, too. So part of it, um, I do amazed at your bravery about how you, now watch me have to get my thyroid out, and I want whatever you have left to do. But, um, but you do um, uh, need to empower those around you. And when you make your choices... Um, Reflect your hopes and not your fear. One of my greatest fears as I became a leader is that I would change into someone I didn't like. And, and, and for those of you who know me, you know, there's not a chance that was going to happen, but I worried about it. And I got this great uh, note from Tom Howard, who was one of my residents uh, who was working in Indiana when I took that job. And he said, I remember you as a chief resident. I remember what you did and how you taught us and how you, you really were different. I was only the sixth woman to finish the UCLA program. And, and uh, when I came back, really the only first woman on faculty there. Uh, and, I, and he said, don't, whatever the wind brings, it was just beautifully written. Don't do this. Don't let it change you. And I kept that card on my desk so that I wouldn't change. And, and it was tough changing culture. And wherever you are, sometimes culture, they say, takes seven years to change. Well, I was at Hopkins for 11. You know, So it, it's just those kind of things where you get the right teams on board and you have to change culture according to your culture. Uh, and I tell you, I've been at all sorts. I've worked at many places, and uh, Wake Forest Baptist has its culture too, which is wonderful and great, but very different uh, than Sacramento, Milwaukee, and Baltimore. And so part of it, you need to make sure you have your hopes. 
People watch you as a leader. Uh, when I had a flat tire at Hopkins, I didn't have a specific spot to park, but uh, people knew what ramp I was on. And 34 people came into the office to tell Peggy my tire was flat. Now, if you don't think people are watching you, they watch you wherever you go. Now I have a parking spot. It's a number one spot. You know, I took a picture of it. So I have a number one spot where I am. So everybody knows if you're there every day. And also people commented on what I wore, just similar to what we've seen in the political arena. So for a year I wore black, which isn't me. You know, as you notice, I don't wear black. I, I wear, sometimes wear black. But, uh, so I changed that so they would quit looking at what I wore and listen to what I said. This is one of my favorite statues. It stands in New York by the, uh, the uh, Wall Street area. And brave is being the only one who knows you're afraid. As you go in and, and do approach the thyroid from your new orifice, or you're trying to figure out the parathyroid, or doing the robotic adrenals and all the things you do. And I have recently read about how people aren't getting referred to you. You know, as, as surgeons, I always thought I did a great job. No matter who came in, I took care of them, despite what they paid or who they were. We had a few smokers in my career, you know, that we wouldn't operate because they were still smoking. That was probably the only thing I did. But I just read how people aren't getting to you either, that they're being underdiagnosed, and, and that was at the American Surgical for these diseases. Being a person who is hypothyroid, I'll tell you that. I had Hashimoto's, can't you tell? I'm very unenergetic now. Um, but I've been hypothyroid since I was uh, 18 when I was diagnosed to do that. And, and so part of it is you need to make sure they get to you. So uh, being brave to go out there and say that we need to have increased diagnoses, get increased access to you, uh, so people don't get the sequelae of the problems they have being underdiagnosed. Now, I must admit, as a surgeon, I didn't recognize that till I started leading. At Hopkins, I ran the operating rooms and all the surgical services, so I learned a lot about hospitals, and that was when timeouts started. That's when the 80-hour work week started. They actually thought the 80-hour work week was my idea when I came to Hopkins. You know, I was like, it's a national thing. It's not just me. Um, but I actually learned a lot about that. We had three wrong site surgeries the first year I was at Hopkins. And so part of that is to making sure you're brave enough to make changes. And now that I have been a dean and vice chancellor in Northern California, which has a huge underserved population, undocumented population, and now in North Carolina, since we're not an expansion state, who can get care? How do we get care? How do we make more people healthy? so that we can take care of everyone in an amazing way. That's what I do every day when I talk to my daughter-in-law. That's what I do. So how to be brave. Uh, have that brave stance. Have that blunt fear. My one granddaughter, uh, Zoe, stands like that all the time, you know, to do it. Say, I'm not doing it, Nana. And I go, yes, you are. And she goes, why is that? I, Cause, and I tell her, that's just the way it is. Uh, and so you need to have that brave stance. Role models are key. I've had amazing ones. I became a surgeon because of Tom Witt, who's a breast surgeon who just retired at Rush. I became a vascular surgeon because of Ron Busatil because I was in his lab. George Sheldon had tremendous effect on me. I serve on a board with Haile DeBoss now for Aga Khan. He taught me how to do hernias when I was an intern. Those are the people we look forward to and love, and surgery is full of amazing role models. Act to never avoid regret. Yesterday I had breakfast with a medical student. I was a student with him 38 years ago. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He just retired because he's had two heart surgeries. I hadn't seen him for 38 years, and we sat there and said, do you have anything to regret? I have nothing to regret. Now, it didn't go so well, okay? It's not like it was perfect. But live every day as if it's that great big day, uh, whether it's clinical, your family, whatever it is, to, so you have no regrets. And always visualize outcomes. You know, now we started an outcome center at Hopkins, and we all are looking at outcomes. You know what to expect with your surgery and my surgery. That's so different than 30 years ago. When we started doing some of the procedures I do, we had no idea if they worked. I remember learning how to do thoracic outlet surgery from her MAC letter, and there were no outcomes. We were the outcomes, and now we know. But also visualize outcomes for your life. Look for how you're going to practice what you're going to do. Are you learning something every day? I just gave that talk at the American Surgical. Why do you take these jobs? I have to learn something every day and, and figure out something new and exciting. So figure that out for yourself. Energize, encourage, and empower others. I think I do that very well. And the key to that, the secret, is if you energy, energize and encourage and empower others, you get it back 
in spades. You get energized. You get encouraged. You get empowered after you come. And me coming here today and seeing Martha lead and, and, and residents I've trained and people I know makes me feel great that I got up early and drove across the state. You know, it was just great to be here to do that. I also, when I drove across the state, no one can bother me, right? You can't talk on the phone anymore. It's fabulous. So I just watched the sunrise and got energized, encouraged, empowered. So how do you find balance? I actually think I've done it well, but I'm not sure I decided that I was going to have balanced my life and that's what's going to happen because I wanted to be a surgeon I, and I worked really, really hard to do that. Ron Busadil told me a couple years ago, he goes, you know, you were one of the best residents. No, you were the best resident I ever trained. I said, well, you could have told me. I mean, he never said that to me, although I thought I was still going fast. Um, so I actually think for me is coming up with non-traditional schedules, uh, reconnecting with family. I spend every, now I have three kids. I have two stepkids, three grandkids. Uh, and my son lives in Baltimore now. Every month I try to reconnect at the American Surgical. It was our 25th wedding anniversary, so they all came uh, to Phoenix. Do those kind of things. Make that work. Let someone else carry the load. Team uh, science and teamwork is probably the biggest reason I think most of us now can make it work. And, you know, before we never handed off anything. Do you remember saying if you transfer them to medicine, they're sure going to die, right, to do it? Or if you're off every other night, you'll miss half the good cases. You may all that you know, to do it. So I think now that you can do that, you can have a flexible pace. Now, my family will tell you I'm crazy. You know, I move so fast, I go here and there. For me, you know, I chill out, and you do need to get um, chilling out things that are short. You can't, like, go hike for four days every week. You know, you have to figure out how you take a three-mile walk with my husband yesterday. I also do a lot of sewing. I'm making my granddaughter a dress at, at working last night. So whatever that is, that's what you do. I have a pretty good sense of humor, but those of you that know me know I'm, t I'm tough, too. I didn't get here because I always laugh and always let you have your way. You have to figure out a way you can confront and change and feel comfortable with that. And then I do put on my calendar something that's called Time to Breathe, which is an hour or two that's the best time for you. If you haven't read Daniel Pink's new book, When, I would recommend it. He wrote Drive, which was very good about why you come to work. When is what you should do. Are you better in the morning, the afternoon? When should you make changes? When should you make decisions? Uh, my chair of anesthesia just gave that to me. It's a great book. And remember, no one will die if you take a day off. I was just telling Julianne, you know, when you become a leader, too, everything's a crisis. And I always said, did anybody die that wasn't supposed to? Then if that's not true, then there is no crisis here. We can go forward. The other thing you need to do is figure out what you're good at. And if you haven't taken uh, Tom Rath's Strength Finders, you can either do it online or get the book. You need to do this. And the adage is, by our age, no matter whether you're a resident or a student either in the audience, there's things you do well, and there's things you don't do well. And there's a very little chance you're going to learn how to do those things you don't do well, well. So give it up. You're not going to do this. You're not going to become a pole vaulter. You can't um, go do amazing things. You can't, I can't sing. I'll never be able to sing. That's just the way it is. But there are things you do really well, and this book will show you that. They give you Likert scales that are very bizarre, you know, like compare a cow to a car. You know, like, well, I like both, and you have to go back and forth. I said, this is not going to tell me anything, right? Well, it nailed me. It nailed me perfectly about who I am. And then if you know who you are and you spend your time, most of your time in there, you will be a happy person. So mines are strategic, of course. I'm a CEO and dean. Futuristic, I remember at Hopkins, they said, why do you keep telling us what it's going to be like? Why are you like that? I'm very positive. Uh, I uh, have a leader right now where I am that has all my characteristics, but positives last. You know, don't make positive last because no one will want to talk to you, okay? You need to have positive first. Individualistic, I think I'm good at looking you individual, what should you be doing? And then I'm achiever, like most of us are. Most surgeons come out with that. You want something done, finished, completed, thyroid out, parathyroid identified, whatever that is, it's done, right, to make it happen. And if you 
know your weaknesses. You may have to do some of those. I'm not a detail person. I don't. Actually, he teased me today. We had trouble pulling our slides out because uh, I have to use this cryptic thing now. Uh, and he said, well, you know, you probably want to make your slides a little bit different. Well, I don't make slides. I have someone else do that. You know, I, I don't make airline reservations. I have someone else do that. You know, I, I don't do that stuff because I mess it up, you know, and I don't do my schedule either because I book three people at once. And so part of it is know what you do and then know what others should do with and for you. Mentors are key. If you don't have one, go get 10. I have so many mentors, I use many of you to help me think of that. They look out for you, they take care of you, they can be all over the country, collect them. Collect them your whole life. The reason I'm a chair is George Sheldon. He told me I should be a chair. I never worked for him, I just knew him. Uh, I looked at the chair at UNC and I did not get that job, but then I ended up at Hopkins. You know, it, it was great. So find your mentors, enjoy those people. They can be physicians, they can be surgeons, they can be friends. I find that there's many people that will help you think things through and be on your side. And they will teach you time management uh, skills. And for those of you young in the audience, if you don't have time management skills, get them. You need to get them. You cannot be disorganized your whole life. You won't get anything done. You'll be disappointing patients, other people. You'll go crazy as you try to balance your kids or your family or whatever activities you have. Get your time management skills down. Last night I was talking to my son and we're going to see him this weekend in Baltimore and I couldn't remember exactly the time we were landing. And he goes, I can't believe it. My mother doesn't know her schedule for Friday. I mean, you always know exactly what you're doing, Mom. And I said, it's been a long day. Uh, so, uh, but he knows that's me. I book, organize, do those things way ahead of time. And then help residents, new partners, help them. I remember when I started, it was sort of a sink or swim, very competitive. I have many stories where people weren't nice or fair about referrals, OR time. When I started at UC San Diego, nobody had block time that was new. So I did all my cases between 3 and 11 at night because I had no block time. And I got to know David Hoyt really well because he was the trauma surgeon. He was there at 3 to 11 doing trauma. I was there doing elective vascular surgery. And then one day, one day I got a first start with an open AAA and I was so excited. And I walk in and there's the intern. <laughs> and we had no fellows back then. So what are you doing here? I said, where's the chief resident? President. Oh, he's in the room with Dr. Orloff. I said, oh, okay, they're doing a port of cable. He goes, no, they're doing a hernia. <laughs> I go, okay, so here I am, first year faculty. I sort of go in there, that little dog, right? To, hey, Dr. Orloff, I trained with his son. I know Mark really well and Susan. I said, hey, there must be a mistake here. I said, you know, I'm doing an open aneurysm. You're doing a hernia. You got the chief. I got the intern. I think we ought to switch, don't you think? He goes, yes, yes, yeah. You can have the chief resident as soon as I'm done with the hernia. <laughs> and I was like, oh boy. So I go back to my room and I looked at the intern and I said, we're going really slow here. <laughs> and eventually, by the time we got to the retroperitoneum, the chief was there. So instead of doing that, maybe recognize that maybe the brand new attending could use a chief resident to help them with their case. That might be nice. Or maybe you could help them with the case. I had many great surgeons at Hopkins and similar at Davis and now at Wake, they will just sort of walk in when you know they're doing a crazy case or walk by. I know I did. Just to go in and say, how's it going? What, how's it look? And really be flexible with your time. You know, we used to put the young people on all the call and, and my business gave them all the varicose veins and the dead feet and all that. You know, throw them a carotid, throw them an aneurysm. You know, give them, don't give them the redo case or the one that the unusual patient. Be nice, be flexible, take some call. Get to know their families. Make their family your family. Uh, now, not everyone's comfortable with uh, saying everything about their lives, but I tell you, if you become each other's families and you become each other's partners in more ways than just cases, I actually think it works out well. And then you'll be dedicated to there forever. I am blessed with residents and faculty and people that come up to see me after I left. And I do think the way I look at success is that when you get ready to leave an institution, which actually I've done quite a bit, as you know, because I've moved a lot, is that people uh, will have that party for you before you leave and not after you're gone. <laughs> that, that's, that's one sign. And then when they ask, you know, should she or he come back, they go, yeah. And they can list one or two things you did to make the place better for everyone, not just you. And you can be passionate. You can be innovative and bold. 
you can accept new opportunities. I do think surgeons are well equipped to lead healthcare systems, hospitals, clinics, labs, whatever you want to do. We can go forward, make decisions. We know how to do M&M &M and realize we did it wrong. I'm sorry, it was wrong. Let's do this. We know how to do that. I, I think physicians need to really take over running what we do instead of complaining about it. You know, we need to be there making it better. It's going to be tough. We've got to be brave. We don't have enough money. There never will be enough money. I worry in the next five to ten years, salaries are going to go down. They, I mean, they're not paying us enough, and you all know that. So we've got to figure out how to do less with more, more healthy people. So when you do that crazy operation, you get paid well for it. You know, that's what we need to do. And then you need to um, really don't be safe or comfortable. I've, I've never lived my life safe or comfortable. Always go do something that's really right outside your realm. Push yourself, stretch, and your confidence, and you'll find yourself just eager and active to go to work. And I think those are the things that are so amazing, um, that is that you will find the right opportunities or the right reasons to go forth and do great things. Uh, go about your work with integrity. At Hopkins, we actually had a holiday party where we all voted. There were like 15 garbage cans of our five core values, you know, teamwork, uh, uh, collaboration, integrity, and we all got to vote with five pieces of paper. And if you voted, you got a slip so you could be in the raffle and win money, okay? So money always works just like with your children. You give money, then they vote. So everybody voted, and the number one um, value was integrity by a mile. Think of the last person that lied to you or didn't tell you the truth, and think about what you think about them now. So make sure you always tell the truth. And the good news is when you get older, you have to tell the truth because you forget what you said. Okay, so now I always tell the truth. But when you're younger, you can remember whether you didn't tell the truth. But always tell the truth. And always tell the same story to everyone. Because if you tell three stories, they will find each other in the bathroom or on the golf course or in the pool. And they will tell you told them three different things. Affect change. Be a good colleague. I always tell residents and uh, faculty, you know, would you, it, would you be in a different room when I was in another room doing a case when you're supposed to be operating on me? What would you do if it was your family? Uh, would you do this to that? It, it's assuming you love your family, right, to do it. But do what you would do if it was you or your family. Listen more than talk, that's really hard for me. You know, I'm a real big talker. I'm an extrovert over the cliff. I'm an E beyond belief. I, they don't even, they can't even measure it on those Mariah Briggs. So I have to listen. Now, I also, when I talk to you, I can listen to two other conversations at the same time. So, I, it, I, so if you're next to me, be careful, you know, because I can hear. Um, and I actually do uh, focus on trying to listen. And you don't have to solve everyone's problem with that first conversation. Always do a little bit more expected. Praise others more than yourself. Be a genuine collaborator. I saw that with Martha as we went forward, really looking at different approaches for thyroid disease. She partnered uh, with the otolaryngologist. She partnered with anesthesiologist. You've got to partner with people. You'll never regret that. And then let people know you need help. I once had a faculty member at UCLA whose wife was really sick, getting chemotherapy. He was trying to take his daughter to work, to, to school before coming to work for a first case. And he was always late. And then one day he crashed his car on Mulholland Drive. And I said, what happened? And it turned out he was trying to take his kid to school, but also have a 7.30 start. And school started at 8. Well, you can't do that. But I can give you another day, or you can hire someone to take your daughter, or you can get home early one or two days a week. Figure it out. Let me help you. But you can't be in the OR, first case, if you're at school dropping off your daughter. Both very important activities. Both can't be done at the same time. So you need to own it, okay? I have a hashtag out there called Own It that we did. I am on social media, for those of you that know. I'm actually Julianne said, weren't you just in Toronto last week? I was, and I got stuck in Toronto last week because of weather. They shut down the airport Friday night. Very special. Uh, hard, to get to, hard to get to Greensboro from Toronto on a Saturday, but here we are, so I did that. Um, but you need to own it. You know, take those opportunities, take chances. I, my, my presidential address for the Vasker Society was on strategy and chances. Take chances on other people. They always surprise you and do great things. Occasionally, it won't be the great thing, but most times it's amazing. John Wooden said things work out best for those who make the best of how things work out. 
that's my life. You know, I've been divorced. You know, I, I have stepkids. Um, I, I've had many disappointments. You know, I looked at, I don't know, six or seven chair jobs, about 10 dean's jobs. You know, there's, it's, it takes a long time uh, to find the right fit. And I always thought I'd get the first job I looked at. It's not going to happen. But then you could get the best job when you uh, get the one that is matched for you. This is a real... Um, saying from one of a fortune cookie is it, that I got last year. It's not the strong, but the response of that survive. I respect you more when something goes wrong and watching you how to fix that versus someone that everything goes right for. So if something goes wrong, really manage it, own it, do the right thing. Because that's when we look at you and say, oh, there's a leader. It's a mess, but there's a leader. So look out for each other. Create pathways for success for yourself, your team, and others. I find it's very easy to find people that want to help you if you let them lead and let them go. I was on a conference call yesterday. We have a little issue going on, and my team of five was there, and we need to do something today. And it's pretty um, tough. And I said, well, you know, i got to go give this talk, but I could come back and on. And they said, you know, we can do that for you, Julie. I've been there for a year. I can have that conversation. Two of them said, we'll go have that conversation. We'll make that happen. We can do that. We've got your back, Julie. And whoa. And at first I thought, well, you know, what will they think? I'm not. You know. But the thing is, they can do it. I've worked with them. It's my president of the system and my uh, senior associate dean for faculty. They can do this. And they know exactly how I want it done. And they know exactly how it should be done. So empower them. And I get to have lunch with my nephew today, who's a Duke Medical School student. So that's what I'm doing instead of driving back early. So I think that's what you need to do is empower others. Take a chance on others, as I mentioned. I've never regretted that. I take people and put them right to the cliff, beyond what they think they can do, whether it's a resident in the operating room, right? I teach thoracic outlet surgery. I teach people how to take a rib out through a keyhole, right, through the armpit. And there's three big structures there that can go bad, right, quickly. I teach that. So if you can teach a keyhole, which maybe that's what you guys do too, a keyhole, and you can teach, you can teach someone how to have a tough conversation. You can teach someone how to go have that conversation they're having for me today. You can teach someone how to lead a team. You don't always have to be that way. Uh, there are now 21 uh, chairs of surgery. There are women in the country. And, and actually, at our leadership conference uh, 10 days ago, I got to sit and smile and watch everyone else run it. It was great watching those that come behind you do it and bask in their glory. It's just an amazing feeling. And then this is from George Patton. Um, I don't measure a man or woman's success by how high or he or she climbs, but how high he or she bounces when you hit the bottom. I gave a talk on resilience when I gave the Olga Jonasson lecture at the college, and it really isn't bouncing back. It, it's really bouncing up. I think as you go forward and you have disappointment, you know, something that goes wrong with your patient, um, something goes wrong with your family, health issues in yourself or others, uh, things that happen uh, to your partners. It's that's when you're going to be great, is that you're going to say, okay, we can do this. We can bounce up from this and make it happen. And, and those are the times that leaders really sail, is when you come out of that and you bounce up. And when I think back to all the things I've done, it really are those struggles that made me a better person. And you don't have to change. You can be your person. You can lead in your style. I had one of um, my medical students at Wake come up to me after I gave a talk a couple weeks ago. And he goes, did, did it take a while for people to get used to you? <laughs> and I go, what does that mean? You know, these millennials are just lovely. You know, I, 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 gave, a, I gave a talk to them on, on mentorship and what the responsibility of a mentee uh, to my first and second year. And a gal came up and said, you know, I almost didn't come because I didn't think I'd get anything out of your lecture. <laughs> and I was like, you should have left that out. Uh, but I really, 
but I really found it, I didn't understand that a mentee has responsibilities. And I was like, thank you very much. But so I, so this one yesterday, this is why I'm a dean. It's just a hoot. And I go, what do you mean get used to me? He goes, well, you, you talk different than others. You, and, and your leadership style seems a little bit different. And I said, well, you know, it suits me. But you do need a bunch of leadership styles, right? You need one that's funny and entertaining. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure you all were out having a wonderful time last night. You know, you want to be entertaining, so uh, you, you say that was a good lecture. But there are times you have to be tough. You have to be decreeing. You can't take consensus. So you need to have all those things so that you can be a great leader. And I think as you go forward, you're going to develop more styles. You'll know just what to do, when to do it. And I do have a CEO council that I work with every week that's, uh, you know, my uh, lawyer and, and uh, my marketing person and my philanthropist and all of us talk. Never let a group of really smart people, which is your lab team, your division, your department, give them a problem every time you see them. They're best when they're talking about something they don't know anything about because they can help you lead. They'll see it in a new light that goes, oh, I should have done that. And it's amazing how we waste smart brains in rooms in, cor in corporate areas. Use them. Bring them up. I did that at Hopkins. I brought the division chiefs a problem almost every month to help me solve. So this is a fellow that I work with that owns all the car dealerships in Western North Carolina. He's my chair of the board, and he is so smart. This actually came out of a book also from uh, Michigan when I was there uh, about how you create good outcomes. And it's really all about high challenge, high care. So care, care a lot challenge a lot. And he's an amazing board chair. He went to UVA, uh, Martha, and then came back and helps us run uh, the hospital because I have a pretty big fiduciary board. So I want to thank you again. Uh, I didn't make that slide. Someone else did. Wasn't that great? Okay. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank you again for allowing me to come here. I am so proud of Dr. Zyger getting this position, but we knew she would. She was a leader, and Andrew can really taught me about the, your specialty. I'm so proud of her now being a chair of a department. I'm proud of all of you that I've had a chance to interact, whether I've taught or trained you or gave boards or knew you or hired you or whatever. Hopefully I didn't fire anybody in the audience. That would be sad. Uh, but um, I really do appreciate being here. And go forth, be brave, be lead, and go do something that's way outside your comfort zone next week. Thank you very much.